thanks for joining me, students, for another exciting edition of my never-ending lecture on general chemistry. In the chapter that we just finished, I taught you about uh, chemical equilibrium, that is, equilibrium reactions. Those are reactions where you've got a two-way arrow, one going to the right, one going to the left. With that knowledge kind of in our minds, I'm now going to introduce you to equilibrium reactions that involve acid and bases, or better said, acid-base equilibrium. In my typical fashion, I'd like to begin by sharing with you a funny chemistry cat of the day from quickbeam.com. This one says, if organic chemistry was easy, it would be called biology. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I should apologize to any biologists. I don't really want to offend you. I don't actually think biology is that easy um, because I'm an organic chemist. I like organic chemistry and find it to be much easier than biology. But anyway, it did make me at least laugh. After this series of lectures that are going to follow here, as well as some that will follow afterwards, you guys should be able to do the following. First, explain what an acid and base are. Next, know what hydronium is. Know what a conjugate acid and conjugate base are. Determine an acid's conjugate base and a base's conjugate acid. Be able to identify the acid, base, conjugate base, and conjugate acid in an acid-base equation and propose acid-base equations and derive their dissociation constants, or Ka expressions. Furthermore, after this series of lectures, you should also be able to know that the higher an acid's Ka, the stronger the acid. Sort acids according to their strength by using their Ka values. Sort conjugate bases according to strength by using the Ka values of their acids. <laughs> Predict which side of an acid-base equilibrium will be favored and memorize the names and structures of the following strong acids listed here. Now beyond this, after this series of lectures, you should also be able to know that the most common water-soluble strong bases are hydroxide stuck to alkali metals and alkaline earth metals, and be able to make calculations using pH, pOH, and Kw. It's a long lineup, and it may seem daunting, but trust me, by the time you're done with these videos, you really will be able to do all of this stuff. With that said, let's get started by first talking about one of your five senses, that of taste. Taste is one of the five senses we use to experience the world around us. Receptors on the tongue are sensitive to chemical stimuli that lead to five basic taste sensations. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, from the Japanese word for delicious and triggered by glutamic acid. That was a new word for me too, umami. The sensation of sour is a response to the presence of acids. Acids and bases are important in numerous chemical processes that occur around us. So speaking of taste, I wanted to teach you about an artificial sweetener called aspartame, whose structure is shown right here. Aspartame is an artificial non-saccharide used as a sugar substitute in some foods and beverages. It was first sold under the brand name NutraSweet. Since 2009, it also has been sold under the brand name AminoSweet. It was first synthesized in 1965, but the patent expired in 1992. Aspartame was discovered in 1965 by James M. Schlater, a chemist working for G.D. Searle Company. Schlater had synthesized aspartame as an intermediate step in generating a peptide of the hormone gastrin for use in assessing an anti-ulcer drug candidate. He accidentally discovered its sweet taste when he licked his finger when it had become contaminated with aspartame to lift up a piece of paper. And thus, aspartame, or Nutraceet, was discovered. Okay, now that we've learned about equilibrium reactions in our previous chapter, which once again are reactions that have two-way arrows, we can begin discussing acid-base equilibria. There are three different ways of defining the terms acid and base. Here are two. We'll discuss the third during a later lecture. The first one was outlined or proposed by a chemist named Savant Arrhenius. Savant Arrhenius defined an acid as a substance that produces H plus ions when dissolved in water and a base as a substance that produces OH minus or hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. Substances that do either of these two things are called Arrhenius acids or Arrhenius bases respectively. HCl is an example of an Arrhenius acid. When dissolved in water it does this, dissociating from HCl to form H plus and Cl minus. NaOH, or sodium hydroxide in contrast, is an Arrhenius base. When dissolved in water, it dissociates to form sodium cation and hydroxide, or OH minus anion. Thus, we see once again that an Arrhenius acid is a substance that forms or produces H plus ions when dissolved in water, while an Arrhenius base is a substance that produces hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. Now, as it turns out, the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases has its limits. 
For example, it's restricted to aqueous solutions. In 1923, two chemists named Bronsted and Lowry came up with alternative ways of defining acids and bases. According to their definition, an acid is a substance that donates H plus ions, called protons, and that sort of sounds like the Arrhenius definition, but check this out. According to Bronsted Lowry, a base is a substance that accepts H plus ions. Substances that meet these definitions are called Bronsted Lowry acids or Bronsted Lowry bases, respectively. So technically, what I showed you before, where HCl dissociates to just from H plus and Cl minus, that's actually kind of a lie. When you dissolve it in water, what actually occurs is the H plus that's donated by the dissociated HCl gets attached or appended to a water molecule. That produces chloride anion and H3O plus. That's a water molecule that has been protonated by a single hydrogen. NaOH, in contrast, is a Bronsted-Lowry base by the following measure. If I take NaOH and dissolve it in water, the NaOH dissociates to form sodium cation, and then this hydroxide, OH minus, does dissociate, and it removes one of these two hydrogens from the water to then become itself H2O. And what does water become? Well, because it has one hydrogen removed, it becomes hydroxide or OH minus as well. We see then here that this Bronsted-Lowry base sodium hydroxide actually has accepted a proton, in this case from water. So once again, a Bronsted-Lowry acid is a substance that donates H plus ions, while a Bronsted-Lowry base is a substance that accepts H plus ions when dissolved in water. Let's look with greater detail at the reaction of HCl with water once again. If you were to actually look on a molecular level at what's occurring, what we'll see is that HCl, shown here, is interacting with the water as follows. One of the lone pairs on this oxygen in water reaches out and forms a bond with the hydrogen on the HCl acid. When that bond forms, the water molecule now becomes protonated. That is, it's had a proton or hydrogen attached to it. This converts that water molecule into this, H3O+. Please note that the oxygen in the middle actually does have a full octet. The reason it has a formal positive one charge is because it's sharing more electrons than it likes to in a neutral state. As the oxygen forms this bond with this hydrogen, that pushes these two electrons up and onto this chlorine, releasing it as a chlorine anion. Once again, we can see then that in this reaction, HCl is donating an H plus to water. That makes it a Bronsted-Lowry acid. While the water is accepting an H plus from HCl, which in this case makes the water a Bronsted-Lowry base. So, once again, a Bronsted-Lowry acid is a substance that donates H+, while a Bronsted-Lowry base is a substance that accepts an H+. Returning to this reaction, you'll of course notice that when H2O picks up this proton, it becomes H3O+. Now, just so you know, H3O+, is called hydronium. And yes, I want you to remember that word. In the chemistry world, H plus is actually a shorthand way, a lazy chemist way, of writing H3O plus in aqueous solution. H plus doesn't actually exist. It's too unstable. When you have H plus floating around in, in water, what it does is it gets attached to a water molecule almost instantly to form H3O plus, which is once again called hydronium. So when you see an H plus written, please remember that it's actually a shorthand way of representing H3O plus or hydronium. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope that you'll join me in my next one in which I'll start teaching you about conjugate acids and conjugate bases. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.